Good morning, everyone. Thanks for uh, joining us this morning to talk about the fall semester uh, at ASU. My name is uh, Katie Packwit. I'm the Vice President for Media Relations and Strategic Communications here at Arizona. Thanks for uh, joining us this morning to talk about the fall semester uh, at I'm ASU. My name is uh, Katie Packwit. I'm the Vice President for Media Relations and Strategic Communications here at Arizona. Thanks for uh, joining us this morning to talk about so oh, apologies for that. Uh, I was getting some major feedback on uh, the uh, webinar live stream there. Hopefully our technical folks are working that out. Um, joining me today is uh, Saquant Jaj, who is the Vice Provost for Academic Innovation and Student Achievement. Uh, Saquant is here to answer questions about how on-campus classes will operate uh, this semester, this upcoming semester, and share details about ASU Sync and iCourses. Um, a little about today's webinar. Um, we are very aware that the impacts of COVID-19 are evolving every day, and we are providing this series of webinars today and every week throughout the month of July to answer your questions to the best of our ability about what fall 2020 is going to look like and to provide you with the latest information about our plans. Today, we're specifically only discussing topics related to going to class in the fall semester. A webinar about life on campus and health and safety measures that the university is taking for the fall semester will be held on Monday, June 29th from 12 to 1 p.m. You can find information about that webinar on our fall 2020 website. It's asu.edu forward slash fall 2020. You can register and uh, watch online there. The first 20 to 30 minutes of our webinar today is gonna to be focused on a discussion around answers to some of the most commonly asked questions that students have shared with us about the uh, upcoming semester. We will take live questions from Zoom webinar registrants only during the remaining 30 minutes of the webinar. So for those who are joining us, type your questions in the Q&A function for us to answer live. We will not be answering questions by texting in the chat function. You have to specifically use the Q&A function. We're also hosting uh, this event uh, via live stream on YouTube because this webinar hit our capacity, which is great. We're so excited that there are so many folks who are interested in what fall 2020 is going to look like. But we're not taking questions on YouTube. Those watching on YouTube can send any unanswered questions to provost at asu.edu. And this webinar will be recorded and it will be shared on our fall 2020 website for those who uh, wanna watch it again or maybe weren't able to join us today. Uh, so with that, um, I'm going to jump into our first question. And this is again, one of the most commonly asked questions that we're getting from students. What exactly is ASU Sync? Saquant, can you give us a little more background on that? Absolutely, Katie. But before I begin, I just want to welcome students and their families to this webinar. It's absolutely a pleasure to talk with you all. Um, before I get into ASU Sync, let's just step back in a time machine, go back to February um, of this year before we went to remote learning and look at how we learned. So there were two major modalities or ways of learning that were in play. You came to campus and you attended classes in person. We call this ASU immersion. Um, or you took classes online and you could have done that in two very different ways. You could have been an online student that's fully studying online, or you could be a student who is what we call a campus immersion student in ASU language or studying on campus, taking what is called an I-course. After March, we went to remote learning where we started um, a new way of deploying learning where we started streaming our in-person classes. So ASU Sync is a way where we are uh, synchronously, that is in real time, broadcasting the class. And unlike the online class, which is asynchronous, that is you can study at any time you want to as a student, ASU Sync classes happen in real time. They follow a calendar, they follow a schedule, um, and you have the ability in these classes to interact with your faculty member directly and communicate to them using a wide variety of tools, including uh, various functions that are part of the Zoom chat or other tools that the faculty member is using. So just defining ASU Sync a little bit more, um, it's a class that is offered in person on campus that is being broadcast live. Students can attend those classes 
remotely from their home or wherever they are on campus or in learning spaces that exist. Uh, they can get questions and answers answered uh, by their faculty members in real time. They can interact with their peers in real time, but it is primarily using video as a function. And um, as we move into fall, this is, we have learned a lot from spring. We have learned a lot from summer and we are really designing classes and taking our ability to use video and synchronous video as a way of learning to a very different level. Not a new technology is being added. But we have over, let's say over, 1,000 classrooms, all of these classrooms are being upgraded. So students would be able to be in class and participate and interact with students who are attending the class remotely. So I think this is really important to understand here that it is not what we did in spring alone. What we are planning to do in fall is uh, you know, a next level of that design where students can be in class and attending classes in person and then they can be attending classes uh, when the classes are being streamed. Uh, we are thinking about a variety of ways in which uh, ASU Sync class can be structured. For example, a faculty member might divide the class into two halves with one group attending classes on person on a designated day and other group attending classes by video. Um, Perfect. Yeah, thank you. Oh, is uh, anything else you wanted to add on that? No, this is good. I know there are a lot of questions and I'll, I'll come back to ASU Sync as I talk about other things. Great. So the next most commonly asked question that we're getting is how do I sign up for ASU Sync? Can you talk a little bit about that process? Sure thing, you don't have to, all right? So almost all our classes, almost all, I think it's really important to stress that point. As I mentioned earlier, all our classroom are being set up right now. Hundreds of people are working right now as we speak to install the technology in the classroom. Almost all our classes are going to be broadcast live. So you don't have to do anything unique, anything new. You don't have to go out and make a choice to sign up for an ASU Sync class. Now, what do you need to do to actually participate in the class remotely? I would say, tell your faculty member, that you are planning to attend classes via ASU sync modality only, that you're going to be attending only via live stream. But in, when it comes to signing up for a class, you do not have to go anywhere and make a choice and choose ASU sync as a way of enrolling in the class. So uh, there on our screen here, um, you know, we see an image of a, of a class search. And so walk us through the process of a student who is you know, gonna be joining us this fall and is interested in you know, taking classes via the sync modality. They wanna take, you know, they wanna be on campus and attend some classes in person and attend some classes via ASU sync. What will that process look like of seeing what classes are available uh, via sync? Yeah, this is a great question, Katie. And thank you for that. So when you go to that page uh, on class search, there are Broadly speaking, there are two kinds of choice, choices you'll make. Um, there are classes you can choose that are in person and you should assume that most of the in-person classes are also going to be available via ASU Sync and there are, are there, you can choose high courses or you can choose search for online courses if you're an online student. In this case, for the audience, which is here, in-person and I courses are primarily the first choice you would make. So you'll choose that category, you go in there. When you, um, get the classes and most of the students on this call, I believe are already signed up for the courses. So it's not uh, where most of us are at this moment. But when you go in there, you'll see just as we did in spring, you would see for the in-person classes next to it, uh, a language where, where it'll, it'll tell you that this class, how to get to that class via the sync modality. So you don't have to do anything unique. Mm -hmm. There are few classes that are going to be in person only, and we are talking about only few hundred classes. So it doesn't apply um, to majority of the students. And let me just list, give some examples of that to just make it easier for people to conceptualize it. You don't have to do too much here. Um, there might be class, if you're a law student, there are certain sort of meetings or classes you might have where you're working, let's say with a judge in an in-person class. If you are an engineering student, you might be in a lab which is using 
really high-end equipment that can only be experienced in person. You might be in nursing and you have a practicum which has to be done in person. You might be a music student where you use equipment uh, that really is available uh, physically in, 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 in a particular place. So those are you know, some of the examples of classes mm -hmm. where you, your class might be in person, but in majority of the other classes are going to be available both in person and via ESU Sing. And as the schedule uh, appears to you, it'll carry a link uh, just as it did in spring so that you can access your class um, by clicking a button, which will take you to uh, the ASU Sync access, which is the Zoom access. If for some reason you are among that very small group of students uh, who are enrolled in a class that is going to meet in in-person only, that class in the coming days will carry a note which will just simply call that out to you. So you don't have to worry. In general, you don't have to worry about this piece. Most classes, I'm talking here about 99% of the classes are available in person and in sync. Great. And how many classes are we offering this fall semester in total? You know, I, I'm guessing here a little bit, uh, yeah. over 10,000. And I think right. there'll be only a few hundred, uh, maybe 300 classes that'll fall in this category. So this is this is an area, I know there's a lot of concern about uh, this piece, but we are building a learning platform where we will be able to broadcast every class. And we're yeah. doing so, so that there's great degree of flexibility so students can attend the classes through the ASU Sync modality where the class is being streamed. You can interact with your faculty member live. You can mm -hmm. ask them questions. You can interact with the students live. Mm -hmm. And it is not one of those things where you have to make a choice and so on. Um, right at this moment, yeah. Right, okay, perfect. All right, next question, which we kind of covered this a, a little bit, but we'll see if there's anything else that you wanna add. Um, how will I know when I will attend class in person and when I will attend via ASU Sync? It's a great question. So um, I know, again, um, students and their families are thinking through this. Um, so usually how would a faculty member design a class? Let's just, I'm a faculty member, let me just talk about that for a minute. Mm -hmm. um, so for social distancing, if you're teaching, let's say Tuesday, Thursday, you would probably divide your class into two halves, or if you're teaching your class on um, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and thirds, and different groups of students will attend classes in person, or you know the others will be attending the classes through the ASU Sync modality. So uh, there are two things you can do here. You can reach out to your faculty member if there's a preferred day and say, you know, I'm trying to group my classes on a certain day. In most cases, that would be the case. But tell them, share with them your preference. That's one way to do that. Be proactive. I'll say wait for a few weeks uh, as we come closer to the class. The second is faculty members would most probably use the last name of students, divide the class into two half. They'll reach out to the students before the class starts and clarify mm -hmm. uh, when the classes, uh, when they have to be in class and when they can attend the classes remotely. And again, want to stress, uh, that if for some reason you have to cla attend class only remotely uh, for classes that are, the majority of classes are uh, 99, as I said, percent are available through ASU Sync, uh, then you don't, you have that flexibility also. So that's something to keep in mind for those who are really concerned about this stuff. Right. So this is a great visual on the screen here. You can see, you know, we have a faculty member who has, you know, uh, about half the, the class in person. And then you can see on the screen, half of the class is zooming in. So this is a, you know, potential, uh, potential classroom scenario. This might be the Tuesday cohort that's attending in person. And then on Thursday, it would be reversed. So the folks on the screen would be in the classroom and the folks that are in the classroom would be on the screen. Um, so I just wanted to point that out that, you know, this is a great visual demonstration of, of how ASU Sync will work. Um, okay, next question. Um, what is an iCourse and how do I register for one? Yeah, so uh, iCourses are primarily what we call an online course. They differ from ASU Sync uh, in that iCourses do not follow the kind of uh, class schedule that you meet at a specified time. They are what we call asynchronous. That is, you can um, learn that material on their own, your own schedule. Mm -hmm. um, so an I course is an online course taken by students who are not in an online program. Mm -hmm. So that's one way of thinking about it. So most of the students on this call 
are uh, will be taking an I course if they're interested in um, an online course, which is very mm -hmm. different in design um, than an ASU Sync course, where you're interacting with faculty in real time. Right. Um, essentially, you go to the class search. Uh, uh, the image shows very clearly, as I was describing earlier. Uh, you will choose the button for in-person and I courses, mm -hmm. and then you will choose the online uh, course version for your particular um, um, at, at bottom, and then you'll make other choices based on you know your your subject area or your department and so on, the level that you're interested in. And these are not new. We have long offered yeah. I courses for so for returning students, you know, uh, they should be familiar with this uh, this format and this setup. But again, we've we've long offered I courses. The biggest change here really is again that we are making all of our in in person classes available via ASU Sync, so that students again have the flexibility of attending some days in person and attending some days, you know, via ASU Sync or you know for longer periods of time via ASU Sync if circumstances. You know, require that that they do so, um, and so what we're really you know trying to achieve here is is giving students a uh, a set of options, you know, a way to to build their schedule so that it's accommodating for for their needs. It helps the university in terms of uh, fulfilling you know social distancing requirements. Um, but we're really trying to again provide choice and, and flexibility for students here in terms of course options. Anything you want to add to that, Saquon? Yeah, well said, Katie. I, choice and flexibility are driving this. And the other thing I would say is um, faculty um, showed great degree of flexibility in spring. They're driven by the idea of, you know, making sure that students are successful in their pers learning pursuit. And I think um, that mindset they bring to uh, every class that they're teaching. So if, if students are concerned, they should know that faculty at ASU deeply care about their students and they will work with the students uh, on whatever challenge they might be they might be facing. So flexibility and choice and then uh, uh, committed faculty, I think uh, is, is, is uh, our sort of recipe for success here. Yeah, it's great. So next question. Uh, we have announced that a small number of classes may be on campus only. You talked a little bit about this uh, at the beginning of the webinar. What if uh, a student needs to attend one of these classes, but they can't make it in person? W what's the solution there? Um, so these are highly specialized classes. Mm -hmm. And I, I believe we, and we are working through this and how we can limit the number. But it, to be successful in this class, you have to attend the class in person. So then the solution here might be to work with your academic advisor, work with them on coming up with a academic plan that can ensure that uh, your academic progress is not, not jeopardized. I think mm -hmm. that to me is the best course of action here. Mm -hmm. Good. Work okay. with your academic advisors, let's come up with a plan that allows you to make progress uh, in your new degree. Perfect. Let's talk a little bit about classroom setup. Um, another very commonly asked question is how will classrooms be set up to ensure my safety? Talk a little bit about what, what it's gonna look like when students actually go to a class on campus. Yeah, so um, I know a lot of questions on this topic. Mm -hmm. Let me look at it from two or three different perspectives. Uh, one, I've talked a little bit about technology and I think it's really important to stress the point that all the classrooms are being upgraded as we speak. Uh, we are making sure that each of these classrooms would have, you know, uh, high-end cameras that would have, faculty would have microphones so that the quality of the uh, instruction that is being broadcast from the class is very high. So that's, a, that's an important change in how we teach and learn within the classroom because we are going to be using that technology and the high-speed internet that is available on campus to really bring students together who might be in two different places or many places in the classroom, right. uh, really in the classroom. So that's one thing. The second mm -hmm. thing is within the classroom space, because we have made these investments in technology, we now are able to social distance within the classroom. So you can reduce the number of students in the classroom. Mm -hmm. There'll be, for example, chairs that will carry note of sort of some note, some way of identifying not to sit in that chair. Uh, and we, we will, students will know how to social distance within the classroom. There'll be signs and other things posted on it. So that's the second thing. 
Uh, and then the third thing is within the classroom space, there will be cleaning supplies that will be available for two mm -hmm. students. So um, if you want to clean your sort of uh, learning space, you can do that. Faculty will have access to the same material. They can do that. Um, and I think that's the, the other sort of important point that I want to mention within the classroom space. Now classrooms are also going to be cleaned daily. High touch uh, surfaces are going to be cleaned within the classroom space multiple times. Um, within the classrooms, you might, the other addition you might find in many classrooms is the use of an instructional assistant who will be working with the faculty member to help, um, you know, or sort of uh, use the camera and other kinds of things in class to stream. So the classes will thoroughly look different, um, but they are, we're designing the learning experience to make sure that the classroom space is safe and the learning experience is high quality. Um, I'm happy to talk more, Katie. Well, and so I would also just note, uh, you know, we, you see in this photo that a number of our students, or all of our students in the photo are wearing face coverings. Of course, we are requiring face coverings uh, on campus in ASU buildings uh, for, uh, for everyone. Um, so that'll be a requirement. And, and all students will receive a kit at the start of the semester that includes face coverings and uh, a thermometer and, and other, um, you know, personal hygiene materials, hand sanitizer, things of that nature that hopefully they can carry with them when they're going to class and use them, you know, th use those materials throughout the day. I know we'll also have new waiting spaces uh, installed, uh, shaded waiting spaces installed throughout campus so that students can, you know, watch the flow of traffic coming in and out of classrooms and um, that will help us, you know, regulate some of that flow. So lots of things happening, you know, to the physical infrastructure of the classroom and the campus and also making sure that our students have, you know, the, the supplies that they need to, uh, to ensure their safety. Um, and again, a reminder that we will have a, a webinar focused specifically on the, the health and safety of the campus uh, this Monday at noon um, for those who want to join in and, you know, learn a little bit more about that process. Can so you, let me add something to this, uh, yeah. and the, to the previous question. I think the other thing that is happening that's really important to point out is uh, uh, at this stage, thousands of faculty members are redesigning their courses. Yes. So I think that's a important consideration in all of this because we are, we'll be learning in this new way where mm -hmm. students are in class and students are attending the classes uh, as they're being streamed. We have to think through um, how would you increase social interaction? How would you actually uh, design a course where students can be in multiple location and learn together? So that's right. an important part uh, because of that design, because of the technology, it allows us to learn in a safe way. Yeah, this is this is really no small undertaking for our faculty, right? I mean, this is not just setting up a camera and you know uh, and you know uh, broadcasting the the lecture and then you know sending students on their way. This is actually a very very intense, sophisticated process that we're undertaking with our faculty. And there are I know course designers that are working directly with the faculty who understand how the technology works and are advising our faculty on the best way to uh, create a course that serves students who are attending in the classroom, but also serves students who might be, you know, attending via sync, as you said, anywhere in the world. You know, we're going to have students who are joining us from all over the U.S. and all over the world. And so we have to make sure that we are creating an environment that allows all of them to learn the same way they would be learning as if they were physically present in the classroom. So it's really, really a significant undertaking. Um, next question that is uh, coming up quite a bit. Will students be required to go to an in-person class if it makes them uncomfortable? Can you talk a little bit about what that process will look like? I mean, the short answer here is simply no. You will not be asked to go to an in-person class if it makes you uncomfortable. And I think that is the reason why we have uh, designed this highly flexible system. Call right. ASU Sync. We're building the infrastructure. We're, we're building, uh, redesigning our courses to make it happen. And we are sort of designing to make sure, as you mentioned earlier, Kitty, uh, the whole question of time zone. So if you are uncomfortable um, to go to a class uh, that is in person, that let's say is, assume a class that is meeting um, Tuesday or Thursday, you, you've been assigned to go to the Tuesday class, please work with your faculty member, send them a note. 
I think mm-hmm. we're all as faculty, we are approaching this with great degree of flexibility. We want to make sure that our students are feeling safe um, and comfortable um, so they can learn. That's great. Um, okay, let's see here. Next question. If I know that I cannot attend any classes in person on campus this fall, what do I need to do? Um, great question. So I hope by now you're getting a sense that ASU is uh, deeply committed to making sure that there is flexibility and choice available to our students. We're redesigning our classes. We are changing the infrastructure. We're changing all the sort of the support systems that go around learning. So coming back to this question, um, if you are, if you cannot attend any classes in person on campus this fall, please let your faculty member know in advance so that they are aware of the kind of choice you'll be making. And well, they'll, because the, all the classes are going to be available, majority, I would say almost all, that's perhaps the best way to uh, frame it, are going to be available to uh, via ASU SING, uh, mm-hmm. it, it would be very easy for us to accommodate those mm-hmm. kinds of things. So maybe you're a student that lives in New York and you just know that you can't get here for this fall. You'd like to get here for this fall, but you can't, but you maybe want to get here for the spring. So, you know, the, the best advice is to again reach out to all of your professors for all of your classrooms, uh, for all of your classes, explain your circumstances and, you know, make sure that you are able to, you know, attend via sync, which, you know, should be uh, uh, an option 99.9% of the time, it sounds like. And then, you know, as soon as you're able to get here, we'll get you here, right? That's as, as kind of as simple as that. Absolutely. And I, I want to hear talk about the international students. Mm-hmm. Um, and we are working um, very hard at this stage to, to offer a set of courses um, that are, that, that will be available to students, let's say they're just in China or India and attending a class via ASU SYNC. Well, I mean, it sounds good, but then you have to get up in the middle of the night. Well, that mm-hmm. doesn't work really. We, we don't want our students doing it. So the classes are going to be, a lot of those classes are going to be uh, made available at a time that is appropriate for students in those time zones. So I think that's an important point. Secondly, in many classes, you'll be recording the classes and those classes, this is a faculty choice, faculty prerogative, but especially for classes where a lot of students are in different time zones and we know what those classes are, you know, what classes the students are taking. Faculty will be recording classes and making those recordings available to students. Tutoring services will be available to students in a time zone appropriate way. So tutors will be available when you will be learning. Mm-hmm. So you'll be changing the schedules of when tutoring services are available. So I wanna mention those things to just share with you that a lot of thinking has gone into the design of the learning system. It is very flexible. It will be able to accommodate your need and we will be delivering very high quality learning experiences that we have always done. Uh, That's terrific. I I guess I would summarize that by saying we're doing everything humanly possible to meet students where they are. Uh, That's always been something that we've prided ourselves on, but particularly, you know, in the midst of COVID-19, given just these, you know, circumstances that, um, uh, that everybody, you know, finds themselves in, you know, travel constraints, uh, things of that nature. We're doing everything that we can to meet students where they are to ensure that they can, you know, continue their educational journey and uh, stay on track toward their degree and ultimately get their degree. So I, I think it's really terrific. Um, next question. Is there a chance that on-campus classes will be moved to fully remote, like in the spring semester? Um, I know this question is in front of uh, many students and parents. Um, As a faculty member, as an administrator, my work currently is focused on getting everybody back on campus, giving high-end learning experiences, and keeping everybody safe. But I also understand that uh, in spring, for example, when we had to go remote, we were able to do that very successfully, very fast. Uh, and we learned a lot from it. So for some reason, if we end up in those kinds of situations where university's leadership has to make that choice, we are very able to accommodate those needs as in terms of the design of our learning mm-hmm. system. Mm-hmm. That's great. But right now, we're still planning for on-campus yep. 
It is for fall 2020 and, and nothing has changed as of today. So I think that's terrific. Next question is, do I have to attend class in person after Thanksgiving? So our academic calendar continues for about two weeks after Thanksgiving. Um, the, there's no change in our academic calendar. Uh, for some reason, if your life circumstances demand that you have to make a different sort of choice there, I say you reach out to your faculty member. ASU Sync classes are available. Uh, you can attend classes via ASU Sync uh, for the exam week. Please work with your faculty member on that. Perfect. Okay, we are now ready to move into our live Q&A uh, session. So I've got lots of questions coming in here from, from the audience. And first up, um, this is a great question. What technology will I need to take classes via Zoom? And what if I cannot afford the tech that I need? It's a great question. Um, I would say you would need, and here, you know, the answer could vary based on your major. So if you are a graphic design major, the answer might be different. But in general, in general, you would need just a standard Windows or Apple PC that mm -hmm. has a webcam and a microphone because you might be attending classes via ASU Sync. You need to make sure you have a camera, you have a microphone, um, so you can talk to your sort of faculty member and your peers in the classroom and a standard machine would do. In addition to that, if you're planning to attend classes from a location other than the campus, you would need a reliable inter internet access. Now, the second part of that question was, what if I cannot uh, you know, get this technology? We have, uh, in spring we did that very successfully. We had hundreds of laptops available for our students uh, from our library. We'll continue that practice in fall. There'll be on-campus labs also that are available to students with appropriate social distancing, so you can use the technology there. Mm -hmm. um, and we shipped hotspots so students could uh, uh, access internet from wherever they might be uh, mm -hmm. when they're there. So a standard machine with a camera and a microphone, mm -hmm. a reliable internet access uh, is what is needed. But mm -hmm. know that if you're not able to, for some reason, get that, that we would have within our library uh, equipment that you, you, you will be able to check out. So that is terrific. And I'm gonna ask some of the folks that are on this webinar supporting uh, you know, in, in the background to uh, find an email address that students can write to if they have technology needs. I wanna be able to point students in the specific direction that they need to go if they do have technology needs. So we'll come back to that after I get that email address. Uh, but that's terrific. We, we don't want you know, lack of technology to be a barrier for students progressing towards their degree and getting what they need from the university. Um, our next question is, how will ASU be managing bigger classes this fall? So uh, great question. And I would just say uh, to everyone, we are as faculty members actively designing these things, right? So a um, couple of things that we have um, uh, in the mix right now is clearly we would be uh, reducing the classroom density by using the ASU sync, so reducing the number of students present in a classroom. Um, and then um, there are, you can further reduce the class size by recording some of uh, the lectures um, um, in advance and making them available um, via sort of recorded lectures and the classroom time is used for discussions of smaller groups. So, Faculty members are thinking through various combinations, permutations and combinations of how to take large classes and reduce the social density using either the ASU sync modality or recording, pre-recording the lectures and using the class time in smaller groups to do that. Uh, this is a very active discussion that is taking place at this time, Katie, and we're gonna continue to yeah. work on that. So there's, a, I think, you know, one way to look at it is there's there's no one size fits all for every yeah. single class. 
classroom, right? Because every every single classroom varies in size and in terms of you know numbers of students it will be attending. So it's really up for you know that up to the faculty member to determine. Okay, this is the space I have to work with. This is the number of students I have to work with. How can I design this experience so that you know we're we're fully accommodating social distancing and safety measures, and again providing a high quality educational experience. So for viewers viewers out there, as you know, Saquon said this is an active discussion we're looking at numbers we're looking at spaces and we're making sure that you know come august 20th that um everything's ready to roll in terms of you know appropriate spacing and, and classroom sizes and things of that nature and a gentle reminder to everybody asu prides itself in having small class sizes mm -hmm. so this this idea of uh, you know large classes when you hear it, it, it you should not assume that asu classes are all in, in general you know with hundreds of students you have a small number of those classes, we're going to be working through them case by case. We're looking at the space they're in and actively designing those things. That's great. Terrific. Thank you. Um, our next question from the audience is, what happens if international flights from India are not allowed? Um, I think that's a great question. So in terms of our design of uh, how we are applying to deliver learning, um, we are actively working on, as I shared earlier, the ASU sync modality that you can access from anywhere. Then we are working on um, some of the classes, especially for introductory classes, students who are coming here for the first time, uh, first year students uh, to be available in a time zone sort of uh, a specific way. So you can attend those classes via ASU sync. Then the colleges themselves where students are and Roland, let me, let me take your example of uh, the engineering college, Felton, or our business school. They're actively working on developing um, a, a collection of courses um, with um, support, sort of learning support built around them uh, so that students in various locations, um, including India, or for that matter, from anywhere else, let's say China, are able to have access to high quality learning no matter where they are. So if you're not able to come, you can attend classes via ASU Sync. And when the flights start again, you can come here and you can join your Sync class because you know the faculty member is the same faculty member. And you can, once you arrive here, you can join that class and begin to attend the class in person um, like other students. Right. Right, so the goal here is again, we're trying to provide a seamless experience that meets students where they are, accommodates their needs and is flexible so that when they can get here, uh, they can pick up you know, right where they left off, uh, potentially even the day before. Um, okay, so next question. Will students uh, who are not able to come to campus because of COVID and other circumstances be able to have all of their classes online for the fall semester? We talked a little bit about this earlier, but obviously this is top of mind for lots of folks. So as to quant, just talk through, you know, what the answer is for students who can't get here this fall. So online uh, to me refers to something very specific in the ASU language. When we talk online, we are typically referring to I courses. But in this case, if a student is unable to come here for whatever reason, they can, they can you know, very much participate um, in the ASU experience. So they can take their club courses via ASU Sync, right? So they mm -hmm. can attend classes, most of their classes using ASU Sync modality, and they can have other experiences that ASU has. So tutoring services, coaching, you know, there are other support services, there are events that are taking place. You can have the entire ASU experience available to you mm -hmm. um, um, via ASU Sync modality, or some online courses might be there or um, other sort of digital communities that are being created for students to make sure that they can partake in the rich ASU experience um, in the classroom and outside. So the short answer is yes, you can. If you are not able to come to campus this fall semester, you can still enroll in an, you know, in a, in an, on-campus degree program, you can take all of those classes remotely. You can still participate in uh, all the events and you know uh, tutoring and academic services that we would offer on campus. You can access all of that remotely. And then when you can get here, 
then you can, you know, transition to some of your classes being in person, or maybe we'll be at a point where all of our classes will be in person um, and, uh, and, you know, pick up where you left off. And so the, the short answer is yes, you can. Um, we, we also have a very robust online specific degree program, ASU Online. And so um, we have 40,000 you know, plus students enrolled in, you know, ASU online specifically, which those are, you know, degrees that have never required you to come to campus and will never require you to come to campus. So I know that's an option some students are thinking about too. Um, uh, next question is, can we take ASU sync from abroad? And the answer is yes, but talk a little bit more about this. Yeah, uh, I mean, absolutely. Uh, the we have looked, we are very systematically actually working on that question. We have looked at different countries. We have looked at any kind of technology restrictions they might have and how they guide the design of our courses. Uh, and the, and Katie, uh, just like you said earlier, short answer is absolutely yes, you can take ASU yes, sync classes um, uh, remote uh, rem uh, from wherever you are around the world. Um, but we are designing them in a way where they, they can be offered in a time zone specific way. Right? Mm -hmm. We don't want our students staying up in the middle of the night to attend ASU sync classes. So there might be sections might be offered uh, at a particular time or a, if, or, or a faculty member might record a class, uh, make it available. And we are bringing in a set of new learning tools that might allow students to discuss a video even when they are across different time zones. So one group of students is commenting on a faculty member's lecture at one time in a class and the other group of students who are in a Different, air, different time zone are able to come in and comment on it. So this, this idea of students learning together and thinking together and working together uh, can continue even if students are spread out across different time zones. So the short answer is absolutely yes. We're going to be offering classes in a time zone specific way. We're designing classes in a way where students across time zones can interact and the support uh, services that we have like tutoring and coaching and so on would be available to you in addition to the class. I just don't want us to focus on just the classroom experience. I know that's where uh, the interest is, but learning takes place uh, in very social ways. And we are designing these classes to be extremely social in this way where students can interact with each other, learn with each other, engage with each other um, and uh, do things that they were able to do uh, always. Right. Virtual study groups, right? Versus yep, getting together on campus and getting together, you're just doing it in a different format, but you still get that interaction and experience. So that's terrific. Our next question is, are professors required to allow students to attend online if the option is available? In other words, can a professor require a student to attend in person if ASU Sync is available? I don't think, believe that's the case. We are designing a system uh, to be flexible. Mm -hmm. All students have the ability to attend a class via ASU Sing. As I said earlier, 99% of our classes have the ability to be in person and via ASU Sing. And to the best of my understanding, that is not mm -hmm. the case. That's the whole purpose why we are doing it. Exactly. Yeah, we're trying to pr provide a flexible environment, knowing that individual circumstances may change. And that's why we have sync, because we want to be able to, you know, offer students the opportunity to seamlessly continue uh, their classroom uh, experience. Okay, in relation to ASU sync, would we have to register for which days to be on the online, you know, to take the class via sync and in person, or will it be given out as a schedule to each student? So again, I know you talked a little bit about this earlier in the webinar, but, but let's talk again about what the process will look like when a student registers for a class. When will they know to go in person? When will they know to attend via ASU Sync? Um, great question. So first, when it comes to registering for classes, most of the students on this call have probably registered for their classes by now. They don't have to do anything unique to be in an ASU Sync section. Most classes are available via ASU Sync. Your faculty member will be in touch with you and will let you know how they're planning to divide the class into different groups. And the reason, let me just sort of get into why we are differing to this, because we actually have a lot of small classes. And in some places, if the class size is so small, and in particular, let's say the room has the capacity of uh, 
you know, 40 students and the class only has 15 students, there's no reason to split that class into two groups. You can right. social distance very, very easily inside it. So you want flat faculty to have the flexibility to do that, but no class would um, be offered in a way where you're not following the safety guidelines that are in place. So faculty members will be in touch with the students, we'll tell them how they're dividing the class. Uh, usually it'll be based on the last names of students, that's my guess, uh, but faculty member might have other ways in which they're constructing learning teams or learning groups in their class. So mm -hmm. we'll defer to that. If you have any questions, concerns about this, uh, please uh, reach out to your faculty member. And my guess is they'll be doing this a little bit closer you know, to the beginning of August. Uh, so you might not be setting all that up uh, right now, right. Um, but I'm, I'm personally, I'm not, I, I believe differing to the faculty allows them to look at the design of the class, design of the space, interest of the students, if somebody has a preference and accommodate all that uh, in, in, in getting back to students. That's perfect, yeah. So professors may send an email out and solicit a student's preference in advance they may just, you know, take a first crack at dividing the class and then work, work with each, you know, individual student on their, on their, you know, preferred, um, you know, experience, but it'll be, you know, sort of a, an ongoing process before the class starts, but with students, there will be active dialogue with the students to make sure that uh, they're all heard and their, you know, preferences are being met. And this also is a good segue into our next question, which is there a way to only have in-person classes or is ASU sync a must? And I think the answer is, Again, that's going to depend on the individual class and the the professor and the you know size of that class and and whether or not um, you know a classroom can accommodate everybody attending in person. I suppose there could also be a scenario where a student could raise their hand and and would say, "I want to attend in person," you know, all of the time. And then again, that faculty member can work it out with that student and and the rest of the class. But Sequant. What else do you have to say about that? I mean, Katie, your answer is absolutely spot on. I, I think uh, you'll have to engage your faculty member. And um, so if that's the learning need you have, that's how you learn best, be shared with your faculty member. I would say in most cases, faculty should be able to accommodate. There might be unique cases, like, for example, Design of Science Lab is a really sophisticated exercise at this stage. Which, what are the essential things you want students to learn? Which of that is going to be in person? How are you going to build simulations through which students learn? Which of those, that stuff is in ASU Sync? So that's a very involved exercise where it might be difficult to, to accommodate uh, that kind of request because the class that experience is being designed by some of the leading scientists in the country who teach these classes so that all students can learn. Mm -hmm. But I would say if you have a particular learning preference, please reach out to your faculty members. And we are very interested in hearing from our students and accommodating their need always. This mm -hmm. is, and it, this is no exception here. The so faculty will uh, actively work and uh, uh, accommodate student needs where possible. Our next question is, will ASU Sync class videos be archived to watch later or can they only be watched live? Uh, this is going to be faculty prerogative. Faculty decide whether their classes are going to be recorded or not. They've mm -hmm. always done that. This is not a different setting. So they'll decide. Um, some, um, for example, there are classes uh, that we offer where videos have already been recorded, uh, always have been recorded, and those classes will continue in that way. But this is very much a faculty prerogative. Great. Next question, what efforts are you making to train your instructors to utilize this new classroom technology? Talk a little bit about that process. Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> you know, technology is only one part of it, right? It's always uh, people. So I, uh, we, have, we have engaged at this stage thousands of our colleagues. Just, when, I mean, I, I wanna go back to spring, right? Uh, um, and I'm such a geek about this. Um, when we went um, to remote learning in spring, we offered a variety of trainings to our faculty. And you know, we had certain sort of expectation of the number of people who will attend this training. All of that has been totally blown away. Our faculty are so engaged mm -hmm. in learning about how to use technology. I mean, the, uh, the number of training has to be doubled and tripled and quadrupled when we went into it in spring. People are deeply engaged in learning mm -hmm. about how to teach in this very unique way. It's a puzzle. 
it's a great challenge. They're thinking about new technologies, they're redesigning the classes. We have started uh, um, sort of uh, what is called a master class for faculty uh, who, for whom some of them, it's, you know, it's first time engaging with all these tools, great degree of participation, hundreds of faculty uh, involved in it. There are over 100 instructional designers from across the university who have worked on the design of these courses. We're taking the lessons learned in spring where faculty did experiments, like, you know, how do you take a large class? You asked that question earlier. Mm -hmm. Well, all kinds of experiments took place and how to do that effectively. Well, how do you scale that up? So mm -hmm. now we have models that we can use to scale up those kinds of practices in class. Uh, we're deploying new software. So there's software specific training. There is uh, instructional designers working in the design of the courses itself. There are, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, appointments faculty members can make. So a lot of effort being, is being put in and a very engaged faculty uh, actively working on designing a learning experience. We have an entire team of individuals, an office, or it's called our university technology office. And that is their job. Their job is to be experts in this technology and guide and advise faculty on how to use that technology in the classroom. And there, as you said, you know, there's there's daily trainings going on. There's you know a constant communication with faculty who are saying, "Here's what I need to teach. How do I translate this using technology so that students everywhere can get this experience?" And it's a really really robust process of making sure that we can translate everything that's being done in the classroom through technology. Um, and so it's, it's an exciting process. And I know you, know you mentioned earlier that all of our classrooms are in the process of being outfitted right now with technology. We have you know, trucks that are pulling up every day, you know, dropping off um, you know, all of the technology that we need to outfit all of the classrooms on all of our campuses. That's, you know, that's happening right now. So it's a really, really robust process uh, that's taking place. And it's exciting. I, you know, I think we're, we're so excited about what we learned uh, from this spring and what the future holds in terms of being able to provide, you know, classes to students in this, in this new format anywhere in the world. And so I think, you know, it's just, it's a really exciting time. Uh, despite all the things happening with COVID, there's still lots of new and interesting and exciting things happening within education to be able to continue student learning experiences. Katie, if I may just add something to sure. this. Right, so ASU is very different uh, than many other universities. We are mm -hmm. the most innovative university. We have one of the finest technology offices in the country. I, I really believe that. Um, we have hundreds of programs that we offer online for over 10 years. We have you know, tens of thousands of students that we serve. So the institutional capacity to actually imagine this future of learning and then be able to execute on this in these sort of summer months is unparalleled in the nation. We can do things others can only imagine and we're actively working on doing them right now. So right. just, I want people to have the confidence that the learning experience in fall is going to be great. The, the, the technology is being deployed, faculty are working together, and there is great degree of flexibility. There's a focus on people, mm -hmm. how students will learn, how faculty will teach. We're designing these things with people at the heart of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think for that reason, we should be able to take into account the kind of unique needs and unique life circumstances uh, our students have and bring some heart into it. It's not all about technology. Uh, and deliver great learning. Right, perfect. Speaking from the spring experience, some instructors were uh, more challenged than others in the delivery of this technology. Um, will all uh, instructors have assistance to help them? Um, so this, we just talked a little bit about this process, but maybe speak, you know, more directly. And that's, you know, that's, uh, you know, not inaccurate. Some are, you know, quicker and sort of more adept at using technology than others. Um, and so I, you, you, you mentioned that we've got a team of individuals um, that are, you know, working with all, all of our faculty to ensure that they can translate their classes. Um, and you mentioned also earlier that uh, many faculty will have instructional assistance in the classroom, but, just emphasize again everything that we sure. are doing to make sure that faculty uh, can con continue the experience. 
Uh, absolutely, Katie. So um, I think the observation is spot on. We are all at different places in our use of technology. Some things we are really comfortable with, others we have to learn. Uh, and we bring the learning mindset into how we are approaching fall and mm -hmm. approaching the coming year. Uh, robust training has been designed, which looks at from course design to specific technologies that are new to um, how do you, like for, for example, a faculty member might say, this is the problem I'm trying to solve. They don't have to solve the problem themselves. There are experts available, institutionally, instructional designers and others who are working with faculty and solving them. So that's one part of it. Training of faculty and course design. The second is the use of technology within the classroom itself. So mm -hmm. we are designing solutions that are reasonably easy to use. So there are you know, cameras are preset and you, all you have to do if you're in a class is hit a button and it will focus at a particular place. So designing technology in a, in a way which is easy to use uh, within the classroom space. And then in the early weeks when you know the learning curve is going to be steep for all of us, for the faculty and students and learning how to move in and out of you know classrooms and all the good, all that will happen. Uh, there's a team um, that is being developed by our technology office um, hundreds of students are going to be hired across the university to be in these roles where they will be available to faculty members uh, to be trained and some of them will be even in class to handle cameras, etc. Many of these cameras can be also handled remotely. So it's not that you have to be in the class to handle them. Uh, so a lot of thinking has gone on into the choice of technology to make sure it's simple enough and easy to use on one hand. At the same time, there are going to be sort of people support available uh, that we are going to offer as a wraparound services. So if, if somebody is really concerned, all, all they have to do is sort of raise their hand and they can have consulting and all that done prior to the start of class. So we're not going to be learning um, through mistakes. In this case, there's a lot of effort being put in into the design of the experience itself, choice of technology. Right. What is the sort of wraparound service uh, around right. it? And it's important to note that we, we we learned a lot from the spring. We talked about that earlier, but we actually, our spring semester was the most successful in terms of student performance. So I know everybody was thinking, was the transition to remote and Zoom going to impact student outcomes? That was certainly top of mind for us. We were confident that it wouldn't, but we were certainly thinking about that. And that was certainly a topic of conversation around you know, the educational experience nationwide and around the world. And what we found was that students adjusted very quickly to that environment. And as I said, our highest success rates uh, in the spring semester to date. So that's just a testament to not only our faculty being able to transition, but also students' ability to adapt, and persevere, and adjust. And you know, we're unfortunately still in a state where we're you know dealing with COVID nineteen, but um, our students have proven that they really can be successful uh, and have great outcomes in this environment. So we're excited about that. I want to note that we have three minutes left uh, before the uh, end of our webinar. I'll try to get through uh, at least one, maybe two more questions. Uh, this is a great one that caught my eye. Uh, how will students take midterms and finals remotely? Can you talk a little bit about that, Saquon? Uh, great question. So um, here uh, we have sort of three different paths. So one, design of the classes. I've raised this, uh, made this point a couple of times. Faculty can design courses and they're actively designed courses where the way in which you grade uh, does not require you to have the classic midterm where a test is taking place in some way. You can design other forms of assessment which are equally effective that do not require a traditional quote unquote test. Mm -hmm. So I think there's something to keep in mind. And there are a number of university classes where you might be writing an essay instead of writing a test in a particular sort of time setting. So uh, my colleagues are working on that. So that's one thing. Mm -hmm. The second is, we use proctoring software. We have the ability to use all the three or four different kinds of proctoring software available based on the unique circumstances of a course. And in that kind of software, you know, students uh, give their test in a setting where there's a camera and a laptop and so on. And, you know, these things are your test taking is monitored and such. And if, if there's a hardcore test where, you know, you have to give a time test in a certain sort of control setting, we have access and the ability to, to do that. And here, uh, something I said earlier about technology choice is important. Uh, if you have a standard laptop, uh, be it uh, a Mac or a PC, you can take these tests very easily. 
Uh, but if you use an iPad or a Chromebook, uh, it's very challenging because of the kind of controls uh, the test software plays to take your test on those things. So if you're making a choice and getting a particular laptop or between an iPad or a laptop, um, you know, I would encourage you to choose some kind of laptop or other kind of device than either a Chromebook or um, an iPad. So Great. design of courses might not require midterms and uh, final exams in the classic sense of timed exam. And then there is, we have access to multiple different softwares to work in different scenarios that we would deploy as needed and scale it up. Great. Last question. My student is scheduled to graduate in the spring. Will classes already promised to be offered still be offered so students can graduate on time? Yes. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great way to end. Um, so thank you everybody for uh, joining us today for our webinar, really focused on what classes are gonna look like at ASU this fall. If you had questions that were not answered, you can direct them to provost at asu.edu and we will follow up with you. Uh, we try to respond to every single question that comes our way. We also have another upcoming webinar this Monday, which will really focus about on life on campus. What are What is university housing going to look like? What is dining going to look like? What are our testing protocols gonna be for students and employees? So that's really, again, to talk about some of those safety measures and what life will look like on campus outside of the classroom. Um, registration uh, is at capacity, but you can watch the live stream and the live stream link is right there on your screen, asu.edu forward slash fall 2020. And we are gonna be hosting more webinars throughout the month of July. Again, really focused on what the academic and classroom experience will look like and what life on campus will look like. So we encourage you to tune back in if your questions weren't answered, or again, direct them to provost at asu.edu, and we will get you the information that you need. Thank you again for joining us today. Thank you, Saquant, for all of your wonderful answers. And uh, we look forward to seeing everybody in one way, shape, or form uh, this fall, hopefully on campus, um, if not via ASU Sync. Thanks, everybody. Have a great Friday.